הייתה לתערוכת יצירות אומנות. תערוכת החלוץ תוצג במשך שלושה חודשים, וקבוצות מאורגנות יוכלו לבקר בה על פי תיאום מוקדם. על התערוכה, כתבתו של מאיר דיסקין. באכסדרה המוליכה ללשכת הנשיא, ובטרקלין הצמוד לאולם הקבלה במשכן נשיאי ישראל, מוצגת מערב זה תערוכת ציורים מופסלים. התערוכה מיוחדת לדמות החלוץ באומנות ישראל. חלוץ ציירי החלוצים הוא בלי ספק הצייר רנץ הופר שצייר בשנת 1902 עבודות עבור הקרן הקיימת לישראל מאותרות בדמויות החלוצים. עשר שנות עבודה נדרשו לצייר חלוץ אהרון הלוי לצייר את המגילה שאורכה עשרים מטרים המספרת את סיפורם של החלוצים בארץ ישראל. יש לי סנטימנטים מיוחדים לדמות החלוץ היות והוראה היו מכובשי העבודה העברית חלוצים ראשונים פתחתי את שערי בית הנשיא לנושא החלוץ, היות ואני חושבת שהוא מייצג תקופה חשובה ויפה בחיי הארץ הזאת. ויש מסר חברתי וחינוכי לתערוכה. הייתי רוצה שהיא תעזור לנו להחיות את רוח התקופה והימים היפים ההם. ואולי, אני מקווה שהיא תתרום לכך. את המוזמנים שהגיעו לפתיחת התערוכה קידמו מלצרים בחולצות רוסיות ומאכלים כפי שאכלו החלוצים, חמיצת סלק, סלט חצילים ובצלים ירוקים לקינוח. טעם חלוצי, בלבוש מודרני. ואלה כותרות עיתוני הבוקר. ג'רוזלם פוסט. חג המולד, קצת עצוב הפעם. היום נודע שהאבטלה באירופה תלך ותגבר, הארגון לשיתוף פעולה כלכלי פרסם בפריס תחזית קשה לקראת השנה הבאה. באמצע שנת 1983, אומרת התחזית הזאת, תגיע האבטלה באירופה ל-12% מכוח העבודה, לעומת 10% היום. למקצת המובטלים באירופה אין שום מקורות הכנסה, ועל מצבם של אחדים מהם מובטלים בבריטניה, בכתבה שלפנינו. They exist desperate and demoralized in growing numbers. Britain's homeless and rootless simply cannot be wished away. While millions are using cardboard boxes to carry off their Christmas shopping, these men find them a precious commodity. For some, a box is their only home, shelter from the biting wind and the appalling cold. The agencies who keep in contact with them have no illusions about the difficulties of their task or the consequences of failure. In London, the Salvation Army have been providing some special Christmas cheer this week. In addition to the warmth that 12 gallons of soup can provide, they've been purchasing dozens of pairs of socks from money sent in by, among others, London's pensioners. I've got a bit of gravy for this old soup, have you? No, it's not good. Thank you very much. Some rolls, Thank you very much. And how about this as an unexpected bonus? The leftovers from a city party dispatched to the soup kitchen by taxi. Within an hour, the night run has reached the West End, where those desperate for a part-time job in the catering trade have set up bed for the night outside an employment agency. In this cardboard township, no one minds being wakened for the extras that Christmas brings. Under the embankment railway bridge, a hundred men and women line the walls with their blankets, boxes and rags. Here, Scots and Irish accents mingle with those from the North Country. Many have been turned away from overcrowded hostels, while others prefer the familiar company a night in the open will bring. ואצלנו, תנועת התיירות לקראת חג המולד נמצאת בסימן ירידה. הדבר בא לידי ביטוי במיוחד בתנועת הצליינים מאירופה. יושב ראש התאחדות המלונות בירושלים, אבי קסוטו, אומר היום כי חברת אל על, מדיניות התעופה של משרד התחבורה ומלחמת שלום הגליל, הם הגורמים העיקריים לירידה במספר הצליינים השנה. על מצב התיירות בירושלים, ערב חג המולד, מדווח כתבנו אורי כהן אהרונוב. בעוד המשטרה, הממשל, עיריית בית לחם ומשרד הדתות מסיימים את ההכנות לקראת חג המולד, נודע כי אלפי צליינים ויתרו השנה על בואם. כשיגיע לכאן מחר הפטריארך בל פריטי בראש התהלוכה, ספק אם ידע ששבעה מתוך שבעה עשר מלונותיה של מזרח ירושלים סגורים, ואילו במלונות הפתוחים התפוסה אינה עולה על שלושים וחמישה אחוז. עבור פנסיון מלא ישלם האורח עד חמישה עשר דולר בלבד. גם במערב ירושלים המצב עגום למדי. מלון רם הממוקם בסמוך לתחנה המרכזית של אגד, 
צריך להיות משכן אידיאלי לצליינים. כעת, בערב חג המולד, תקבל כאן כמה חדרים שרק תרצה בשליש מן המחיר. כמה חדרים במלון רם? 156 חדרים. מתוכם כמה מהם דפוסים? כ-50 חדרים. 50 להצעות של מלון רמת השלום נענו דווקא ישראלים לאחר שהתברר להם שיקבלו כאן הנחה של 50 אחוז. שלא לפני המצלמה מספרים המנהלים על ירידה של 40 אחוז במספר קבוצות הצליינים. נחום עדיקה, נהג מונית, 12 שנה. נחום, אתה יודע שמחר זה חג המולד הנוצרי. כן. כמה תיירים נוצרים הסעת כבר? עוד לא הסעתי. עוד לא הסעתי תיירים נוצרים, והתיירים בכלל מעט מאוד בארץ. במלון לרום מספר מנהל המלון על תפוסה שהוא מגדיר טובה וגבוהה אך מחוץ לארץ מגיעות לדבריו רק קבוצות יהודיות. כרגע אצלי אין תיירות צליינית והתעניינתי קצת ביתר בתי המלון של חמישה כוכבים אז גם אצלם אין השנה תנועה כמעט אפסית של צליינים. לא הכל רע אם אין תיירות מבחוץ יש תיירות מבפנים חמישה רופאים ושלוש עשרה אחיות ילדו הבוקר במשך שמונה דקות חמישייה שנולדה במזל טוב לגברת מלכה גלזל ולבעלה. הדבר היה בבית החולים אסף הרופא, מצבם של חמשת התינוקות טוב וגם של הגברת גלזל. טוב, אנחנו מקווים. הריונה של הגברת גלזל התאפשר לאחר שנים ארוכות של טיפולים ממושכים, כאמור נסתיים בשעה טובה בחמישייה. בחדר היולדות בבית החולים אסף הרופא היה כתבנו לענייני בריאות בני ליס. זה החמישי זה השני, זה השלישי, וזה הראשון. אנחנו קיבלנו בלידה חמש בנים, שבלידה מצב של כל אחד היה טוב, ואנחנו לא מצפים לבעיות מיוחדות, חוץ מבעיות רגילות שכיחות של פגים. משקלם בין קילו 130 גרם עד קילו 900 גרם, משקל של חמש הילודים ביחד מגיע ל-8 קילו 300 גרם. מה בעל יחס הדבר הראשון לאחר שהוא שמע את הלידה של החמישייה? אני לא יודעת, זה היה צריך לשאול אותו, אבל הוא היה מאושר, אין ספק. אנחנו חיכינו לזה מהחודש השני להיריון. ציפית לחמישה? כן, מהחודש השני להיריון ידעתי שיש חמישה. בעוד שבוע... בעוד שבועיים, אתה צריך לקחת אותם הביתה, יש לך לאן? כרגע הם יהיו כולם בחדר אחד. אחר כך אני לא יודעת, נחשוב איך להתארגן. איך את רואה את זה? וכולם בנים? כרגע הכל נראה לי טוב. <laughs> זה שזה עבר ככה וכולם חיים ו... ו... ומרגישים טוב, נראה לי הדבר החשוב ביותר. שמות? אין עדיין שמות, אבל הם בוודאי יהיו קצרים מאוד. מזל טוב. התחזית לסיום היא אמונה חלקית. אלה הטמפרטורות החזיות הלילה ומחר. מצב בטרם סיום מכפר שלם ששם היו היום התנגשויות עם המשטרה על רקע הריסת בית שם נהרג היום צעיר אם כן מדווחים לנו ששורר שקט מתוח אם כי אנשים עדיין מתגודדים על המדרכות והמפקח הכללי של המשטרה מבקש לתקן דברים ששידרנו מפיו בעניין התקרית הזאת בכפר שלם המפכ"ל אומר שהוא רואה בחומרה פתיחה באש נגד שוטרים ונגד עובדי ציבור, והוא מצטער, כמובן, יחד עם זאת, 
על מותו של הצעיר. אנחנו מסיימים כאן, לכולכם שלום רב. הגרלת מפעל הפיס שנערכה הערב זכו ב-2 מיליון וחצי שקלים כרטיס מספר 2663697 ו-100 אלף שקלים שלושת הכרטיסים שמספריהם 228011 ו-039212 הכרטיסים המסתיימים בספרה 7 זכו ב-30 שקלים כל אחד מפעל הפיס לקידום החינוך והבריאות תשדיר זה מיועד לכם, למי שתרמו להקים במבצע גג לילד המפגר. לכם מגיע לדעת מה עשו בתרומתכם. ההוסטל הוא בית מגורים בקהילה. ממנו הם יוצאים מדי בוקר לעבודתם, ואליו הם חוזרים עם ערב. בהוסטל הם מקיימים מפגשים חברתיים, מבלים ומנהלים חיי שגרה. אין הם רוצים ליפול למעמסה על איש. הם דואגים לעצמם, ואף עוזרים לשכניהם. תן מבט קדימה לנשארים מאחור. עזור גם אתה להבטיח להם קיום נאות במסגרת החברה והקהילה. מה עושה לכם הצילום הזה? אתם מרגישים לא נוח, נבוכים, אולי מרחמים? איני יודע, אבל אם כן, הנחות שלי מתחילה בראש שלכם. שמי יצחק פרלמן, אני כנר. בישראל 350 אלף נכים, עיוורים, חרשים, נכי גפיים. ולוקים בפיגור. אם תיתנו לנכים הזדמנות להשתלב בחברה, הזדמנות שווה בתעסוקה, נוכל יחד לגלות את האדם ולא רק את הנכה. אל תשכחו, הנכות שלנו תלויה ביחס שלכם. תודה. May 1960, secret agents in Buenos Aires kidnap Adolf Eichmann, one of the men responsible for the destruction of European Jewry, and bring him to trial in Israel. Early in 1963, secret agents carry out a sabotage and assassination campaign against German scientists who are aiding Egypt in the development of unconventional weaponry. April 1979, 
Secret agents in France blow up two nuclear reactors destined for Iraq. According to the international press outside of Israel, these agents all belong to the Israeli Secret Service. This organization serves Israel as a pair of watchful eyes designed to prevent military and political surprises which might prove critical for a country with so small an area and population. Intelligence experts rank the Israeli Secret Service among the four best in the world, along with MI6, the KGB and the CIA. It has been developed through the years. Huge uh, amounts have been spent on, on its development and its uh, application. And uh, a lot of practice, you've got to be good. Israel's intelligence community comprises five organizations. The Foreign Ministry's Strategic Planning and Research Department in charge of gathering data from legitimate sources. The General Security Services, known as the Sheen Beit, primarily operational among Israel's Arab sector and responsible for internal security and counter-espionage. The Israel Police Special Missions Department, which assists the General Security Services, the Israel Defense Forces Intelligence Corps, directly responsible to the Chief of Staff. And the Institute for Intelligence and Special Assignments, better known by its Hebrew name, the Mossad, responsible for Israel's undercover operations outside her own borders. The Mossad gathers intelligence, sends its agents into Arab countries, implements special tasks such as assassination and sabotage, and maintains secret contacts with countries with which Israel has no formal relations. Activities of the various intelligence services are coordinated at weekly meetings of a committee of service heads, chaired by the head of the Mossad, who is directly answerable to the Prime Minister. Coordination is of vital importance to a country whose resources and manpower are so limited. This is undoubtedly one of the keys to the success of Israel's secret service. Mossad workers are generally recruited from the elite units of the Israel Defense Forces. Even those who are assigned desk jobs must have a military background in which they were shown to have courage, leadership abilities and fighting spirit. The Mossad's permanent staff is relatively small. Here, as in the Israel Defense Forces, the guiding principle is one of working in rather small groups whose efficiency is based upon quality rather than quantity of manpower. Intelligence experts outside Israel believe that the Mossad has no more than 1,000 staff members throughout the world. If this is indeed true, then the entire Mossad is numerically equivalent to but a single department of the CIA or the KGB. This is Isar Harel, who was appointed as the head of the Mossad when it was first established in 1952. From the very outset of the Mossad, Harel aimed at establishing its international reputation and at fostering connections with leading security agencies throughout the world. It was, in fact, a Soviet development which enabled Harel to realize these objectives. February the 26th, 1956. At the 20th Communist Party Congress, Khrushchev delivers a speech behind closed doors in which he exposes and denounces Stalin's crimes for the first time, thereby inaugurating the era of de-Stalinization in the Soviet regime. The United States sought to obtain the full text of this speech, intending to use it as a propaganda weapon for turning Russia's Eastern European satellites against her. Alan Dulles, head of the CIA, ordered his agents throughout the world to hunt down and acquire the document at any price. It turned out to be one of Isar Harel's men stationed in Moscow who in fact succeeded in acquiring the text. This man had managed to convince a Polish diplomat who had a copy of the speech and was shocked by its content to cooperate with the Israeli secret service. The speech was smuggled to Poland and was handed over to the Israeli agent who went there by the diplomat's accomplice, another employee of the Polish foreign service. By May 1956, Isar Harel was on his way to the United States with the Western world's most urgently desired document tucked safely in his pocket. 
The speech was handed over to the CIA in return for an agreement pledging exchange of information and mutual cooperation between Israel's Mossad and the CIA. Israel's success in obtaining Khrushchev's speech helped further U.S.-Israel relations and established the status of the Mossad as a leading member of the international intelligence community. May 1960. The Israeli Secret Service hits world headlines for the first time. Adolf Eichmann is captured on Garibaldi Street in Buenos Aires and brought to trial in Israel, charged with responsibility for the destruction of European Jewry during the Second World War. Two years later, the Israeli Secret Service was once again in the spotlight, this time concerning the German scientists in Egypt. This is one of the four Egyptian manufactured missiles first displayed in July 1962 on the 10th anniversary of the Free Officers' Revolution. Later on, addressing an enthusiastic Cairo crowd viewing the missiles in a Revolution Day parade, President Nasser declared that these rockets were capable of striking any target south of Beirut, that is, Israel. South of Beirut, in Israel itself, the reaction was one of surprise and concern. Israel knew that grandiose military projects were being undertaken in Egypt with the assistance of German technicians and scientists. However, a constant update on details and progress of these projects had been sorely neglected. At that time, Israeli secret agent Wolfgang Lotz was operating in Egypt under the cover of a German millionaire horse breeder with a Nazi background. Lotz and other Israeli agents in Egypt and in Europe, after being reprimanded for neglecting the issue, quickly dispatched a detailed report on the missile project and other Egyptian endeavors. According to this report, there were more than 1,000 German technicians, engineers and scientists in Egypt since 1959, working on the development of jet planes, ground-to-air missiles and other types of non-conventional weaponry. At the head of the missile project, codenamed Project 333, were Professor Wolfgang Pilz, a jet engine expert. Professor Paul Gerke, a specialist in launching techniques, and Professor Eugen Zanger, whose field was rocket navigational systems. All three had worked at the Pinimundi factory during the Third Reich era and were involved in the planning and production of Hitler's V-2 rockets. The planned extent of production at the 333 factory was 900 rockets within two years. A short time later, Israel received additional information which was even more worrying. Dr. Otto Joklik, a Swiss engineer working in Egypt, had contacted Mossad agents in Europe and informed them that Egypt, with German assistance, was attempting to develop nuclear weapons and missiles equipped with bacteriological warheads. The information regarding biological warfare was confirmed by Wolfgang Lotz as well. I did discover that uh, some of the German scientists were constructing um, bacteriological warheads for the Egyptian-made rockets, uh, which fortunately were not very accur accurate. And uh, they tried them out uh, in Yemen, in some captured villages. How did you find this out? Uh, I heard a rumor about it at first, and then the rumor was confirmed by a very close friend of mine, an Egyptian general in the general staff. We sat a whole night on one particular occasion over several bottles of whiskey. And this particular man was a very, very nice, a really nice person, thoroughly civilized. Uh, and he told me the story about the reports he had received and read uh, about these uh, nerve gases being used in the Yemen and uh, he became very emotional about it and said to me Rusty this is the first time I was thoroughly ashamed to be an Egyptian general. In Israel this news aroused considerable anxiety. The involvement of German ex-Nazi scientists was seen as a continuation of Hitler's crimes against the Jewish people. In an interview given to a reporter from Westdeutsche Rundfunk in 1965 Professor Pilz gave his opinion concerning the issue. 
Wenn wir mit unserer Gruppe nicht hier wären, würden die Ägypter das genauso tun. Vielleicht hätten sie andere Lehrer oder würden in andere Institute gehen und sich ihre Unterricht da holen. 1962. The Secret Service Coordinating Committee decides to take steps to halt this project. Agents of the Special Missions Department are sent to Europe. On September the 11th, a Dr. Krug, who had assisted the missile project, disappears in Munich. The following February, an unknown assailant fires at and narrowly misses Dr. Kleinwachter, also associated with the project. During the same month, Swiss police arrest Otto Jocklik and a Mossad agent, accused of pressuring and threatening the daughter of Professor Gerke. Israel's man in Cairo, Wolfgang Lotz, who receives his orders. These uh, German scientists, after we found out that they were becoming really dangerous, bacteriological warheads, etc., uh, it was decided to uh, warn them off. They received letters telling them that they would be in trouble if they continued with that and did not leave their occupation. And after they ignored it, uh, several letters were sent to some of them containing small quantities of explosives the intention was not to kill anybody, but just to uh, scratch them a little and scare them off, and this worked. What was your active part in this? Uh, I dispatched some of the letters. And you saw the results directly? Yes. November 1962, the 333 plant in Cairo. A booby trap package, one of many dispatched by Israeli intelligence, explodes killing five Egyptians and wounding many others. One day later, a package addressed to Professor Pilz explodes in the face of his secretary, Annie Laura Wenda, resulting in her becoming permanently deaf and blind. I personally had nothing to do with this particular uh, package. It was sent from abroad, and uh, even the Egyptian prosecutor couldn't hang it on me because it was proved that I had been in Egypt for several months before and after the package was... Yes, but you were part received. of the intelligence service that... Day. I was part of the intelligence service. So how did you so feel about that? How did I personally feel yes. about it? Look, if German scientists undertake a job like that, to build not only rockets, and other dangerous weapons, but also uh, rockets with bacteriological warheads uh, to uh, let loose on my country and the population of my country and thereby kill thousands of people. You have to stop them. We try to stop them nicely by saying lay off. They would not lay off. They have to bear the consequences. In 1963, about six months after the campaign against the German scientist was launched, a turning point developed in the story. After a thorough inspection of the missiles, photographed by Lotz at the Revolution Day Parade, the Israeli military intelligence, Amman, then headed by Brigadier General Meir Amit, reached a new conclusion that the missiles had no strategic value at that particular time and that Egypt was hardly capable of developing any nuclear weapons in the near future. This moderate evaluation clashed with the conclusions reached by the Mossad and its head Harel, who considered the Egyptian project to be a real threat to Israel's existence. Prime Minister Ben-Gurion accepted the military intelligence approach and ordered Harel to tone down his anti-German campaign. He said Harel saw it as a personal vote of no confidence and submitted his resignation from the position of head of the Mossad. Thus, differences of opinion within Israel's intelligence system brought about the end of an era in the annals of Israel's secret service. Ben-Gurion appoints Harel's rival Meir Amit to head the Mossad. Amit instructs his men to continue with their scare tactics against the Germans, cautioning them, however, not to involve the German government. Threatening letters were typed on this typewriter by its owner Wolfgang Lotz and sent to German scientists living in Egypt. These letters, which bore unpleasant reminders of the fate of others, did their job. One by one, the Germans packed their bags and left Egypt. NASA's missile and unconventional weaponry project, designed to strike at targets south of Beirut, began to peter out. 
One person, however, will continue to bear the imprint of this story for the rest of her life. The Six-Day War was Israel intelligence's finest hour. Precise data on enemy aircraft deployment supplied by intelligence agents, including lots, enabled the destruction of most of the Arabs' airstrike force during the first few hours of the war, giving Israel a decisive advantage in the skies. The Israel Air Force also maintained a critical edge in air battles, a fact due in no small measure to Israeli pilots' thorough knowledge of the advantages and shortcomings of the MiG-21, the Arabs' frontline fighter plane. It was a team of Mossad and military intelligence agents who convinced an Iraqi pilot to defect to Israel with his MiG-21 plane just one year before the war broke out. This was the first time that a MiG-21 had ever been examined intact in a country which was not part of the Soviet camp. Israel also maintained a strong advantage in ground battles. It was the late Eli Cohen, a Mossad agent in Syria who had supplied precise information regarding Syrian military deployment on the Golan Heights, thus contributing to Israel's total victory on this front within four days. On the Egyptian front, Israel's agent, who had the rank of an Egyptian brigade commander, supplied Israeli troops with vital information right up to the last minute. On the second day of the war, this agent was shot and killed in El Arish by an Israeli soldier, just as he was attempting to surrender, as it were, to an Israel army unit. This is the French Mirage fighter plane, the frontline aircraft of the Israel Air Force in the 1960s and the main factor in its air superiority in the Middle East. The embargo on the supply of planes and spare parts imposed by President de Gaulle in the wake of the Six-Day War presented a serious danger to the Israel Air Force's striking power. In the Israeli Defense Ministry, it was decided to obtain the Mirage blueprints so that Israel would be able to manufacture its own planes independently. The operation which followed this decision was typical of a long tradition of clandestine operations carried out by the Israeli Secret Service. The aim of these operations, some of a rather piratical nature, such as the 1965 uranium heist, was to break the arms embargo which Israel had experienced on and off ever since 1948, and to preserve a balance of weaponry in the Middle East. Israeli secret agents who searched throughout Europe for someone who could be of assistance in obtaining the Mirage blueprints finally located such a person in Winterthur in Switzerland. His name was Alfred Franknecht. He was an engineer serving as director of the motor division of the Sulzer concern, which held the Swiss franchise for the manufacture of Mirage planes. The Israeli agents, who had done their homework well, knew that Franknecht was pro-Israel and had spoken up several times in condemnation of the French embargo. Israel's military attaché to Switzerland, Nehemiah Kain, approached Frank Knecht at Zurich's Ambassador Hotel. In principle, I'd like to help the Israelis, but I would have liked mostly that it would be possible with the, the knowledge of my firm. Uh, so my first uh, idea was, and I made it also like that, an arrangement between my general manager and the Israeli people who should convince him that he should allow me to help the Israelis. This uh, conference took place, but uh, this director wasn't, didn't agree, so the whole decision remained on my shoulders. It took me nights and nights to decide what I should do with yes or no, because I know I do, I do something against uh, the rules of my firm. But finally I had to uh, decide between who is in danger, Israel or Sulzer. And I saw it was Israel and so I had to decide I should help Israel. At a second meeting, held at a nightclub in Zurich, Frau Knecht agreed to aid the Israelis, requesting and receiving the sum of $200,000 for carrying out his mission. Was money in fact the principal motive for his actions? My motivation money is absolutely not correct. 
My, the money was only involved because I wanted a certain security for myself. This and the, exactly this security didn't work afterwards because all the money has been kept by the Swiss government. In December 1969, the agent in place of the Israeli Secret Service at the Sulzer plant approached and commenced his task. The uh, most complicated part of it was the, the, the amount of, of plans. Uh, I speak about 150,000 plans, if you can imagine what that is. It is a, a real volume of uh, uh, a railway car. And how to get these out, and how to get them away, that is, was a very complicated uh, thing. The plan developed by this meticulous engineer had been worked out to the last detail like a fine Swiss watch. Frauknecht suggested to the Sulzer management that the Mirage plans be microfilmed and then destroyed as they took up a lot of space. His suggestion was accepted and Frauknecht himself was made responsible for its implementation. The blueprints were indeed photographed on microfilm. However, instead of burning the original blueprints, Frauknecht destroyed old plans which he obtained from the patent office. The original plans, replaced by the dummy plans en route from the microfilm apparatus to the incinerator, were eventually handed over to a German courier selected by the Israeli Secret Service in the town of Kaiserhaugst, some 200 kilometers from Winterthur. From there, the plans made their way to Germany and then to Israel. December 1970, Kaiserhaugst. Most of the 200,000 blueprints have already been handed over to the Israelis. The German courier loads up the last four cases of plans when suddenly he notices that someone has recognized him. He panics and runs away, leaving two full cases behind him. His acquaintance, noticing that the cases contain top secret classified material, reports to the police. The ensuing investigation leads to Frankknecht. The perfect Swiss watch has broken down. I think my plan is, has been very perfect and I have uh, uh, paid attention to all the details, very, very much details. So what went wrong? And somebody asked why went it wrong. It went wrong because the man to whom I had delivered the plans afterwards, the bigger deliveries, the, uh, he was chosen by the Israelis and I was told not to ask him questions and not to know anything about. So I didn't know how he continued with the plans. I just, my, ta my task was finished when I gave him the plans, the box, the big boxes with the plans, and then said hello, and my job was done on that point. So he messed the thing? He messed all. He made it someone on a very silly and stupid way, and he was discovered. I think it was a mischoice of the Israeli... Uh it's clear, it's absolutely clear, it was a mischoice of the Israeli agents of the Israeli uh, people to put such a, an uncertain man here on, on such an important thing. Frankneck's trial began in March 1971. The prosecution accused him of perpetrating the gravest act of espionage to be undertaken in Switzerland since the Second World War. Frankneck was sentenced to four and a half years in prison and was released after having served three years. The $200,000 he received from the Israelis was confiscated by the authorities. The man who helped Israel develop her fighter plane industry was left with nothing. The Israeli government uh, did, uh, did not uh, show themselves in, in, a, in, a in, a, in a way that I could say it's a really a good help for someone who has completely lost his career and everything. The Mirage Blueprints operation proved that when it comes to arms acquisition, Israel acts utterly without restraint and will not hesitate to use any means at her disposal. At approximately the same time that engineer Frankknecht was to complete his rip-off on Israel's behalf, another example of the modus operandi of Israel's secret services was getting underway the Sherburg Missile Boats Operation.
In January 1969, a paratroop force commanded by Rafael Eitan, today Commander-in-Chief of the Israel Defense Forces, attacked Beirut airport and destroyed 13 planes in reprisal for terrorist attacks on Israel conducted from Lebanese territory. In response, President de Gaulle intensified the French embargo on arms and materiel supplied to Israel. French customs officials were ordered to halt all military cargoes bound for Israel. In the French port of Cherbourg, five missile boats which had been ordered by Israel were entering their final stages of construction at the Amiot shipyards. In the wake of the total embargo, a construction freeze was imposed upon them. In Israel, a special task force was established whose job was to plan and execute the removal of the boats from the Cherbourg dockyards. Heading this team was General Mordechai Lemon, head of Israel's purchasing division in France. The operation, codenamed Noah's Ark, was to take place in two stages. The first stage called for creating the cover of a legitimate business deal for acquiring the boats. This document authorized the transaction for transfer of the boats. It emerged that the Israelis set up a dummy company called Starboat, registered in Panama as a Norwegian corporation, headed by Mr. Martin Sim. Sim, a Norwegian, then director of the Icar shipyards in Oslo, had had close contacts with the Israelis since the Second World War. Mossad agents were responsible for setting up the corporation. Israel's intelligence services, like similar services throughout the world, carry out a number of activities under the cover of fictitious companies. This method is especially employed in arms acquisition deals, in which it is necessary to conceal the true identities of the parties involved in the transactions. The Starboat Company contacted Monsieur Félix Amiot, director of the Amiot shipyards, requesting the opportunity to purchase the boats for oil exploration in the North Sea. Amiot agreed to the deal, the Israelis relinquished their rights of boats, and the transaction was approved by the French authorities. The second stage of the operation was the military logistic phase. The boats had to be prepared for the eight-day voyage to Israel without arousing any suspicion regarding the identity of the crew or the intended destination of the boats. Forty European-looking people were smuggled into Cherbourg in small groups in order to reinforce the 40-man force already there. The boats were supposed to be sailed on several trial runs at this stage, and crew members took them out to a distance not far from shore. This exercise was repeated several times, and the tanks were slowly filled for a longer voyage. Christmas Eve, December the 24th, 1969. The Café de Théâtre restaurant, located in the center of town, was preparing for Christmas dinner. Among those who had reserved tables were several Israelis. The restaurant reservations had been made in order not to arouse suspicions regarding the Israelis' true intentions. The Israelis, who did not show up for dinner at the Café de Théâtre, had joined their companions on the boats and were preparing for the final stage of Operation Noah's Ark. Christmas Day, December the 25th. At 2 a.m., the five boats left the dockyards of Cherbourg. Lieutenant Colonel Ezra Kedim, nicknamed the Shark, is one of the boat commanders who arrived in Cherbourg with the reinforcement crew. We had intention to leave Cherbourg 24, 10 o'clock p.m. But uh, the forecast of the BBC was gale warning nine. And you have to take under consideration that uh, the whole boat is 45 meters long. So uh, we waited and two o'clock in the morning it was announced that the weather is going to be better but it was still very rough so we left even in the bad weather and uh, this is one of the things that uh, normally nobody would believe that in such a weather such boats will go out who took the decision to go out at that time? It was a decision of all the commanding officers all together. But it was a bit of a risk. But we made it. The true story broke the next morning. A BBC news team passing overhead in a British plane photographed the boats as they made their way towards the Mediterranean rather than their supposed destination, the North Sea. How did the French react? Were they considering military action? Michel Joubert served at that time as President Pompidou's secretary. 
Non, à aucun moment. À aucun moment, et c'est là où l'on voit que les hommes d'État, ce sont des hommes d'État. Et ceux qui ne sont pas des hommes d'État ne seront jamais des hommes d'État. Le président Pompidou, à aucun moment, n'a envisagé quoi que ce soit. Il a considéré que le gouvernement israélien avait parfaitement tort de lui faire perdre la face de cette façon, et probablement que pour la suite des choses, ça n'a pas amélioré les relations entre les deux États. Mais en ce qui concerne une intervention militaire sur les vedettes, ça a été, dès le début, exclu dans son esprit, et par conséquent dans celui du gouvernement français, et par conséquent, ça n'a pas été envisagé. This is the starboat fleet reaching Israel after an eight-day voyage. Were the French deliberately avoiding action in order to let the Israelis get the boats? To this day, there is no clear answer to this question. It was the British who claimed at the time that the French had been aware all along that the boats were intended for delivery to Israel, and that France had gone along with this ruse in order to publicly support her embargo policy while honoring her contract with Israel at the same time. It's worth noting that the British at that time were competing with the French for a major arms deal with Libya. France never issued any official reaction to these accusations, nor did Israel, which had maintained a veil of silence throughout the entire affair. A number of key French officials who had been involved in authorizing the transaction were relieved of their duties. Mordecai de Mon, Israeli military attaché in Paris, was declared persona non grata and left France. In any event, even if France had been aware of the true plans, the starboat company served as a convenient umbrella which allowed for implementation of the transaction and the operation throughout the most critical stages. The secret of success of this operation, like all others, was the high degree of cooperation achieved between the various factors, military intelligence, the Israeli Navy, and the Mossad. Following the Six-Day War, Palestinian organizations began to grow stronger and escalated their terrorist attacks against Israel. The new wave of terror transferred the fight against Israel from a local to a global battlefield, with non-selective attacks on such Israeli targets as aeroplanes, diplomats and ordinary citizens. Responsible for this new strategy were Dr. Wadia Haddad and Dr. George Habash, leaders of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a left-wing organization which also calls for worldwide revolution and was involved with such international terrorists as Carlos and the Bader Meinhof gang. At first, Israel underestimated the danger of this development. On September the 6th, 1972, as news arrived concerning the murder of 11 Israeli sportsmen at the Munich Olympic Games, this approach changed. Brigadier General Svi Zamir, then head of the Mossad, was in Munich at the time of the massacre and witnessed with his own eyes how a German special unit failed in an attempted rescue operation. His subsequent report convinced Israel that when it comes to fighting terrorism, she should only rely upon herself. At a special session of the Knesset, Israel's parliament, convened to honor the memory of the murder victims, the then Prime Minister, Mrs. Golda Meir, declares that Israel will do all within her power to pursue the terrorist groups and strike at those responsible for the Munich massacre. October the 16th, 1972, Rome, 10 p.m. Abdelwells Watar, a Palestinian living in Rome, enters his apartment block at number four, Piazza Annibaliano. He goes into the corridor on the way to his flat. While waiting for the elevator, he is shot three times by unknown assailants who had been waiting for him there in the darkness. Wounded, he staggers into the courtyard, where another ten rounds are fired at him. He falls and is left to die there in a pool of blood. Zwaitar, a Palestinian whose parents and family reside in Nablus, served as the Al Fatah representative in Rome. His job was to convince Italian politicians, journalists and intellectuals, such as Alberto Moravia, seen here with him, of the justice of the Palestinian cause. 
Paris, December the 8th, 1972. The telephone rings at the home of Dr. Mahmoud Khanshari. Dr. Khanshari, PLO representative in Paris, lifts the receiver. A few seconds later, the sound of an explosion rocks the building. Khanshari dies a few days later in hospital, fatally wounded by an explosive device placed in the handset of his telephone. The device was triggered only after those who placed it verified that it was indeed Khanshari who had answered the telephone and that he was alone in the house at the time. This explains the call which preceded the explosion. June the 28th, 1973, Paris. Mohammed Boudia starts his car, which was parked in the Latin Quarter, setting off the bomb which had been planted in it. Boudia, an Algerian who served as Paris coordinator of PLO activities, is killed instantly. Over a period of 10 months following the Munich massacre, no less than 12 Palestinian leaders were assassinated. Three methods were employed. Close range shooting with a 22 caliber Beretta pistol, booby trap vehicles and remote controlled explosive devices. Considering the continuous nature of these attacks and the political affinities of the victims, it was obvious that a systematic Israeli operation was involved. Nevertheless, international police forces investigating these incidents never succeeded in uncovering the identities of the perpetrators. The only remaining indication of Israel's responsibility was Golda Meir's post-Munich Knesset declaration. July the 21st, 1973. Furubaken Street, in the Norwegian town of Lillehammer, some 200 kilometers north of Oslo. Ahmed Bushiki, a Moroccan waiter residing in Lillehammer, returns home with his wife, Toril, after having seen the film Where Eagles Dare at the small local cinema. They get off the bus and walk towards their home. Suddenly, a white Mazda car pulls up alongside them. Two strangers get out and empty their pistols into Bushiki. The car speeds away, leaving Bushiki lying there in a pool of blood. The attacker's car was found abandoned the next day on the other side of town. That very same day, two people were arrested in Oslo near Forinbu Airport as they were returning a rented car. The car's license number had been taken by a policeman at a roadblock on the night of the murder because the passengers somehow aroused his suspicions. The two, Marianne Gladnikov and Dan Arbel, were taken to the police station for questioning. They denied ever having been in Lillehammer. However, a search of their rented flat in an Oslo suburb revealed a collection of receipts and tickets which showed that Dan Arbel had indeed been in Lillehammer both before and after the murder. Confronted with this evidence, the two admitted working for the Israeli Mossad and participating in the murder of Ahmed Bushiki, whom they erroneously believed to be Ali Hassan Salami, the Black September chief of operations and the brains behind the Munich massacre. The investigation of these two led to the arrest of their colleagues, Sylvia Raphael, who held a Canadian passport in the name Patricia Roxburgh, Avram Gehmer, who had a passport as Leslie Orbaum, Zvi Steinberg and Michael Dorf. All six were accused of participating in Bushiki's murder. Following a trial which raised public outcry in Norway and Israel alike, they were sentenced to prison terms ranging from one to five years. The Lillehammer fiasco was the worst thing that could happen to a country's secret service. The boys from Lillehammer, as the team was ironically called by the Israeli press, had gone about like rank amateurs. Team members had no alibis prepared in the event of capture. They left behind evidence which traced all of their steps. Their public behavior in Lillehammer, a small resort town, was more suitable to a large urban metropolis. Eric Hagen, a local journalist, was in Lillehammer at the time of the murder. I think that uh, this group were um, used to operate in uh, big cities. So uh, they uh, underestimated uh, the Norwegian surroundings, especially in Lillehammer, which is a very small city, a very small town. And they drove they drove about here in several rented cars with uh, walkie-talkies uh, out uh, through the windows and uh, they had a very strange uh, acting in this milieu. Most important of all, however, was the fact that a tragic error led to the murder of an innocent man. This is a photograph of Hassan Salami. This, one of Bushiki. 
A quick glance shows that there is no resemblance between the two. Mossad agents were led to this decoy Salome by a Palestinian double agent who deliberately misled them and pointed out a person who was in no way involved with the matter. Mossad agents behaved negligently without even taking the minimum measures required for verifying that the man they were after was indeed the wanted Salome. The capture of Mossad agents in Lilhaman eliminated some of the mystique which had enshrouded Israel's campaign of retaliation against Palestinian leaders. It emerged that the Mossad operated a permanent hit team for implementing assassination missions. The team was organized even before the Munich massacre, but was only made fully operational following the sportsman's murder. The team included an assassination squad, which carried out the actual killings, as well as a follow-up group, like those captured at Lillehammer. The follow-up group would arrive on the scene before the assassination took place and remain afterwards as well, thus finding itself exposed to the danger of capture and arrest, as had indeed occurred in Lillehammer. The assassins themselves, those who actually pulled the trigger or planted the explosives, were thus never apprehended. The follow-up group was based in Paris, while the assassins resided permanently in Israel. Sylvia Raphael, for example, lived in Paris's 16th arrondissement, where her flat served as a meeting place for Mossad agents, and an improvised headquarters from which they had planned many intelligence operations. Sylvia herself lived there under the cover of a freelance journalist and photographer. Before being drafted into the hit team, she had penetrated several Arab countries using this cover, and had met with a number of Arab statesmen, including Jordan's King Hussein. Paris was chosen for reasons of convenience, and also because of the fact that it was and still remains a center for PLO agents and their activities. The uncovering of the identity of members of this hit team, after the Lillehammer affair, provided circumstantial evidence relating to their role in other operations as well. Svi Steinberg, for example, was identified by Mahmoud Hamshari's widow as the man who had subjected their flat to extensive surveillance prior to the attack. The Italian police, which had reopened investigation of Zweiter's murder following the events at Lillehammer, discovered that the gun used against Bushiki was identical to the one fired at Zweiter. It also discovered evidence of the presence of top members of the hit team in Rome before and during the murder of Zweiter. Dan Arbel, who was also involved in the Cherbourg and uranium boat operations, maintained a permanent post box and a branch office of an import-export company in Rome. These were tools known to provide Arbel and his colleagues with appropriate cover and freedom of movement in Rome, a city second only to Paris in its role as a center for PLO personnel in Europe. Similarly, it was discovered that Silvia Raphael had been in Rome, as Patricia Roxburgh, between October the 14th and October the 17th. Also discovered as a result of the Rome and Paris attacks was the trail of Jonathan Ingleby, whose name was recorded in Abraham Germer's notebook, and who was named by the prosecuting attorney in Lillehammer as the Mossad's chief assassin. Ingleby had stayed at the sporting hotel in Rome until some time after Zweitar was murdered. He had rented a car from the Hertz agency, which was seen parked outside Zweitar's home several days before the murder. It had apparently been used in surveillance of the intended victim. Following these findings, a trial in absentia against eight members of the so-called hit team was opened in Rome in November 1980. Italian authorities also requested from Norway the extradition of Silvia Raphael, who now lives in Oslo, married to the lawyer who defended her in court. Israel's retaliatory operations constitute a wide-ranging campaign, from Lillehammer in the north to Nicosia in the south. The scope and intensity of this campaign may help explain why hit team members ultimately began displaying signs of fatigue which led to fatal errors. Briefings of hit team members emphasized that people who are not directly connected with a political conflict must not be harmed. Nevertheless, as in all wars, there is simply no way of avoiding it completely, and many innocent persons joined the ranks of victims in the Middle East conflict. The Lillehammer fiasco seriously hurt Israel and her secret service. The extent of the damage done was revealed only on October the 6th, 1973, with the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War as the Egyptian army crossed the Suez Canal. 
Two weeks before, Sviza Mir, the then head of the Mossad, had obtained the Egyptian battle plans. However, the Mossad's assessment of the danger of imminent war was rejected in favor of more moderate evaluation by military intelligence. Uri Dan, a prominent military correspondent and intelligence expert, comments. Uh, there, there is an interrelation between the fact that uh, Israeli agents were arrested uh, in a scandalous way and in a tragic affair in Oslo, in Norway, in the summer of uh, 73, and the fact that nobody really believed that information four months later, because the credibility of the Mossad, I think so, was in a way uh, compromised after the Lillamer affair. January 1979. Ali Hassan Salami, the Mossad's most wanted man, is killed in Beirut. An explosive device was placed in a car which was parked near his home and detonated by remote control as Salome passed by. The device was operated by a female Mossad agent staying in a flat opposite. At the time this operation was undertaken, according to international press reports, the Mossad was headed by Reserve General Yitzhak Khofi, who had served as OC Northern Command during the Yom Kippur War. Following the war, he was assigned to replace Sviza Mir and rehabilitate the Mossad in order to meet the challenges posed by new post-war conditions. Nineteen seventy-five. Saddam Hussein, then number two man in the Iraqi regime, tours the French Kadarash Atomic Energy Center, accompanied by French Prime Minister Jacques Chirac. Nineteen seventy-six. 